This morning, make the right choice. Make the right choice. We're going to be talking about the life of Joseph a little bit today. And, uh, you know, years ago, there was a Sunday school that was putting on a Christmas pageant. Back when we actually had things like Sunday school, right? That's not that's such a thing that's around too much anymore. But there was a Sunday school putting on a Christmas pageant. And, of course, the pageant included the story of Mary and Joseph coming to the inn. And so there was this one little boy. He really wanted the part of Joseph. And he was, uh, you know, there at the auditions. And now the parts are being handed out. And to this boy's disappointment, he is not given the part of, jo- of Joseph. In fact, the part of Joseph is given to the, another boy in the class who is like his rival in the class. is a kid that he does not like, and he's kind of the new kid as well. So this boy just has it in for the kid that ends up getting Joseph. And our boy that we're talking about, he's given the part of the innkeeper. And so he's pretty upset about this, but he doesn't say anything to the director. He just kind of holds it into himself. And now during all the rehearsals, this boy is thinking about what can I do on the night of the performance to really get even with this kid, my rival, who got the part that I want. He's scheming. He's planning out this, this idea of how he can get even with this guy. And so now finally the night of the performance comes and and it comes to the scene where Mary and Joseph come walking across the stage. They knock on the door of the inn. And here's this boy. He's the innkeeper. He opens the door and he gruffly asks, you know, what, what do you want or something like that. And now Joseph says, well, we'd like to have a room for the night. And suddenly, to the surprise of everybody in the room, the innkeeper breaks from the script. He opens up the door. He says, come on in. We'll give you the best room in the house. Well, of course, anybody who knows the Christmas story knows that is completely divergent from the actual story. And so this poor little boy who's playing Joseph, is he's throwing a curveball this moment. He's broken from the script. He doesn't know what to do. He stands there. He's a little confused, a little dazed for a moment as he's thinking about what can I possibly say? I can't go in. That's not the Christmas story. There's not room in the inn. And so finally the boy, as he's standing there in a few moments, he's thinking quickly, and he kind of looks past the boy playing Joseph, and then he says this. He says, no wife of mine is going to stay in a dump like this. Come on, Mary, we're going out to the barn. (laughs) Just like that, the play was back on track. For a long time, I've I've found I've had an appreciation for Jesus' earthly father, Joseph. I mean, you want to talk about a guy who was dealt kind of an interesting hand of cards, right? I mean, a guy who had to make some tough decisions on the fly. And yet he he handles these challenges that he's presented with with such an impressive degree of integrity. And so we're going to look at his story today. It's it's the Christmas story, his part of it at least. And, and, you know, we're, we're talking about a guy really here who had every chance to mess this thing up. But I think the father knew what he was doing when he picked this guy because he handles it with such integrity. Matthew chapter 1, If you have your Bibles this morning, starting in verse 18, says this. It says, this is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother, Mary, was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. So Joseph, of course, he's, he's pledged to be married to Mary, and this is similar to what an engagement would look like in our culture, except that this pledge was more binding than an engagement today. Today, if you're engaged and you change your mind for whatever reason, you can give the ring back, and there's not a whole lot of you know, questions or consequences about that. You can sort of make that decision if you want to. But in this culture, to break off this engagement, this pledge, literally it required a divorce proceeding. It was, it was that binding of a contract, and it, it required an official divorce proceeding to annul. And so this was a big deal. And of course, as we have just read here, and we also know from the account in the book of Luke that Mary, uh, of Mary and Joseph, that Mary has now become pregnant by virtue of the Holy Spirit. And the wording here in verse 18, it's, it's interesting to me because it says there in verse 18, she was found to be pregnant. That word found just st- stood out to me this week. 
Almost every version of the Bible I looked into discover, uh, uses either that word found or the word discovered. And several commentators believe that Mary's pregnancy, though she knew about it from the angel, we read about that in the book of Luke, that Mary's pregnancy was not revealed to anybody else until about the third month. Because if you know the story, in, right, right after the angel comes to Mary, she goes and, and she visits her cousin, Elizabeth in the hill country. She's there for a period of about three months. And so now she comes back and she is found to be pregnant. And that word found, it's so much different than revealed, right? It's, it's kind of the impression that I'm given is that Joseph is the one who sort of discovers or finds out that Mary is pregnant. I don't know how he found out. I don't know if she started to gain a little bit of weight. I don't know if it was morning sickness. I don't know what it was that led him to figure it out. But Joseph finds out that Mary is pregnant. Now, I know a thing or two about what it's like to have a pregnant woman in the house, right? I mean, I've done this seven times now, and, you know, I love her, but Crystal's not exactly good at keeping a secret when it comes to pregnancy. I mean, you know, I get it. It's exciting news, and it's the kind of stuff you I look forward to, to sharing. But there's been a few times in some of our more recent pregnancies where we've sort of, you know, we've had this conversation. Okay, now we know that, that, that baby is coming, and so, okay, well, you know, let's just keep it under wraps for a little while. Let's not go tell everybody necessarily right away. And, and so we kind of have this agreement. Well, then inevitably, it'll just be a couple of days later, and she'll come home, and she'll be like, uh, just so you know, you know, I told Melissa, and I told my mom, and I told the checkout lady at Walmart, you know. And I'm like, what? <laughs> Yeah. I'm like, well, what about this agreement that we had, you know? And, and she, well, you know, I mean, they, they asked me, and I wasn't going to lie about it. I said, well, why did they ask you? I, I, I don't know. They just, they said that it was just like obvious or something. I don't know. And so they just asked me. And I, I mean, she must just have a, you just have a pregnancy glow about, I mean, to me, you just always have a glow, honey. But, you know, there's a pregnancy glow or something. And so it's just obvious. And you know, here's the thing, quite seriously, though, is you can't keep pregnancy hidden very long, right? Like, that's the reality of it. When you're pregnant, baggy clothes will only get you so far, right? Eventually, you're going to be found out. And so, eventually, Mary is found out by Joseph. But there's something sig significant here. And actually, if you're taking notes, write this down. This is just kind of a little side note. It's not necessarily the focal point this morning, but I think this is so good. When the whole, because remember, she's pregnant by the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit is stirring something in you, it will be made known. When the Holy Spirit is stirring something within you, you cannot hide it. You cannot keep that under wraps. When the Holy Spirit is bringing something new and exciting to life within you, you can only keep it under wraps for so long. And and so when your relationship with God is like firing on all, on all cylinders, it becomes apparent to people around you. It's really difficult to hide it. Now, I would have loved, wouldn't you love to be a fly on the wall for this conversation between Mary and Joseph as this information is now sort of being discussed? Because now, you know, I, I, can, just, I can just picture, here's Mary, she comes back from the hill country. She's been gone three months. She comes back pregnant, okay? And now she's saying, but Joseph... Don't worry, I didn't cheat on you. It's the Holy Spirit that made me be pregnant. Can you see Joseph saying, okay, yeah, all right. Um, yeah, is that a fact, you know? I don't imagine that Joseph received that news particularly well. I imagine that that conversation was probably a little intense. Probably some raised voices. Maybe some things that were said that were on the harsher side. But I want you for a moment to put yourself in Mary's shoes. Here's, here's Mary, and we have to remember Mary was human. Now, regardless of how some churches portray her, Mary was human. She was virtuous, but as virtuous as she was, I don't think she could have enjoyed being accused of being a harlot, because that's the implication here. If you really stop and think about it, that's the implication. Joseph doesn't believe her story. In verse 19 that we read just a moment ago, indicates that he is, he is determined in his heart, he's, he's planning to divorce her quietly. Well, if he doesn't believe that she's pregnant by the Holy Spirit, I should say, if he doesn't believe she's pregnant by the Holy Spirit, and he knows that he, she's not pregnant through him because they haven't come together in the bedroom, then that really only leaves him with one conclusion, right? That Mary has been unfaithful to him. That's the only conclusion that Joseph can possibly draw. And so 
she's, he, he's here thinking, she's cheated on me. So now you have Mary, and Mary is in this awkward position of having to try and explain to someone who hasn't had this revelation from God, right? Mary had the encounter with the angel. Joseph hasn't had it yet. He's going to get one in a little bit. We're going to see that, but he hasn't had it yet. So now Mary has had this, this revelation. She's had this encounter. She's heard from God, and now she's got to try and explain this to somebody who hasn't heard from God. He hasn't had the same revelation yet. And some of you, some of us, can relate to this kind of experience. This is a very, very difficult place to be in. In fact, it's even kind of a, a disheartening or a painful place to be in. You know, um, I, I used to take missions trips down to Mexico with, with students when I was a youth pastor. And so we would go on these trips, and then you, you come back, and on the next Sunday morning after the trip, you would line the whole team up on the platform, and you kind of give this report about this missions trip. And when you're on, if you've ever, ever been on a trip like this, I mean, you come back and you're just excited. I mean, you just feel like you could just, just conquer the world. You're just, Jesus has done incredible things and your students are feeling the same way. And oh man, it's just awesome. And you've had this unifying experience of like 30 kids all together on a bus and you just walk away and you're like, yes. And you can't wait to come back and tell everybody about it, except that when you get back, everybody else didn't have that experience right? And so you get the blank stares. And I can just vividly remember standing there on that Sunday morning a few different times trying to give this report. And we're so excited about what Jesus has done. And then, you know, you get to the end of those testimonies and you kind of just get that, that like customary little golf clap, you know? And it's like so obvious that the people that you're relaying this information to haven't had the same experience that you've had. It was disheartening to the point it actually kind of hurt and you walked off the, the stage almost feeling dejected or rejected, like, man, why don't they get it? Well, they haven't had the same experience. Some of you have had an experience like that. Some of you have, have had an experience where you've heard something from God, and now you're trying to communicate that, and it's not being received because the other person you're communicating it to hasn't Bought that. Some of you were raised in churches where hearing from God was discouraged altogether. I mean, that's not, not your job to hear from God. That's the priest's job, or that's the pastor's job. And others of you have been raised, have been in a position, like, like I've said, where you've tried to explain maybe something to a loved one, and they weren't quite as quick to believe you or to buy in that you were hearing from God as you had hoped. And it's been a painful experience because, you know, you were kind of like putting yourself out there. And so it felt like rejection when they didn't buy in. But let me just say, if, if you can relate to that, and some of us that have experienced that in different ways, it can really hinder your walk with God. It can really hinder your, your willingness to hear from God again. And if you've experienced that, let me just acknowledge, first of all, that must have been a painful experience for you. Um, but I want to also encourage you, don't let that pain uh, of that encounter turn you away from trying to hear from God again. God wants to speak to you. Jesus says in John 10, 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. My sheep hear my voice. He says in John 8, 47, whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. He's talking to the Pharisees in that instant, but whoever is of God hears the words of God. Not only are you and I able to hear from God for ourselves, we're supposed to. We're supposed to. And I want to empower you with that today. As one of his sheep, you can and you should know how to hear his voice. Well, Joseph doesn't buy in to Mary's story, and I can't exactly blame him. Can, I mean, can you blame him for not buying in? Not exactly a lot of previous documentation of people getting pregnant this way, you know, by virtue of the Holy Spirit. And so I kind of get his skepticism here, which kind of, which brings us to verse 19. And I've long been intrigued by Joseph's response to this kind of unbelievable information that he's, he's given, or rather, I should say, I've been intrigued by what his response wasn't. Joseph would have been well within his boundaries to publicly disgrace young Mary. That would have actually been the legal thing to do. As a betrothed woman, Mary would have been stoned as a harlot, according to the law of Moses found in Deuteronomy 22. That was sort of what should have happened. 
yet Joseph clearly doesn't take that action. And yet I, I, I really, I get the internal debate that must have been raging inside of him because on one hand, he loves Mary, and that's probably what makes this perceived betrayal, you know, of their relationship even more painful. He wants to marry Mary, but can she be trusted? And yet, if he doesn't marry her quickly, everyone's going to know what happened, right? Because you can't hide pregnancy, as we talked about. And, and how is he going to handle the controversy of that? And if they don't do a quick ceremony, it's, it's going to look like they violated the law together by coming together prematurely. And, and it's going to be Joseph's neck on the line as well. And so Joseph sort of ends up taking the, the line of action, or I should say the line of action that looks like the best interest of self-preservation is for him to expose her. Now, Joseph doesn't do that, but that would have been the wise thing to do, or so it would seem, to silence any critics before they can accuse him of defiling her by instead publicly humiliating her and ultimately sanctioning her death. That was a very real and a, and a very lawful action that Joseph had to at least have considered. But now we get this glimpse into the character of this man because the Bible says in verse 19 that Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace. He had it in mind to divorce her quietly. I just, I just love that. Joseph, full of integrity to the point that he wants to, yes, remain faithful to God's law by not marrying this person that is being perceived as a harlot. And that would have defiled him, so he wants to remain faithful to God's law, but he wants to do it without disgracing her. Now, the New King James Version calls him, in this instance, a just man. Other versions refer to him as a righteous man. This is an act and an attitude of mercy. It's the actions of a just and a righteous man. Man, he's not looking to destroy another person's character or reputation, but rather he wants to quietly and privately deal from this. Some of us could learn some things from Joseph. Can I just say, some of us could learn, uh, our culture today could learn some things from Joseph about quietly and privately dealing with junk. <laughs> um, you know, maybe, let me just rant for a second. There's, there's some people on the Facebook and Twitter world that could learn some things from Joseph right there. You know, um, I mean, this business of like publicly humiliating your ex or your boss or your coworker or whoever you feel like on social media is just so irritating, honestly, you know, and, and it's sadly not just a teenage thing, right? Like there's adults that do this as well. And I, I see born again Christian adults that do this all the time. Someone hurts them and, you know, rather than, than dealing with it privately and quietly, like, like Joseph had in mind to do with, with this, situation they just kind of unload this post on facebook and kind of let the world know their their whole junk and you know it's funny usually when they do that they keep it just ambiguous enough that it could be like could just kind of be about anybody right so they'll say something like on their post like you know well somebody is gonna find out that they let a real good thing go right now or something like that like ooh, somebody and then, so then everybody reads that post and like i wonder if i'm somebody you know i i don't know if this is this about me i don't think so but the, the thing of it is, I get, like, you're hurt. Like, this person hurts you, and it's a real hurt. I'm not trying to lack compassion about that hurt, but smearing someone else on social media or any other way, gossiping around, you know, in conversation with people, that kind of thing, that's not going to improve the situation. It's not going to accomplish anything. It's not going to bring healing. So great, you get a couple of, like, you know, sympathetic pats on the back and, you know, smiley faces on Facebook or, you know, whatever people do in response to that. But you've completely dishonored God in the process. And you've dishonored everything that Jesus talks about, things like mercy and grace and compassion and forgiveness. And, you know, you're just better off dealing with this kind of stuff privately. Long before Jesus would ever speak the words of Matthew 5, 7, which I'm about to read, Joseph was prepared to live by them. Matthew 5, 7 says this, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Joseph walks and lives in mercy towards this woman, Mary. Psalm 112, verses 4 through 6 says things this way. It says, Light dawns in the darkness for the upright. He is gracious, merciful, and righteous. It is well with the man who deals generously and lends, who conducts his affairs with justice. For the righteous will never be moved. He will be remembered forever. Listen, when we're hurt, when we're mistreated, when we're offended, the Lord is calling us to walk uprightly, 
in grace and in mercy and in righteousness. And to the one who does this, he promises to shine the light into their darkness and to stabilize their lives. Now, you've probably noticed, as I have, the reverse principle in action, right? That those who tend to operate in sort of a deficit of mercy or a deficit of grace and and, and, and forgiveness, etc., their lives seem to constantly be surrounded by drama, right? Because they're not operating in mercy, and so they're, they're not tending to receive mercy. And that's a biblical principle. Do you want to receive mercy? Jesus says, start by giving it. Joseph does this, and he has, he has every intention of dealing with this, this situation quietly and privately so as to not smear Mary's name and drag it through the mud. And she, he's going to do what he can to leave her family name intact. And it's extremely commendable. And actually, I believe it's one of the reasons that God hand selects Joseph as the father, the earthly father of Jesus, because he's a man of character. And that brings us to verse 20 of Matthew chapter 1. And it says there, it says, After he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. There's something so subtle here. I mean, so very subtle. And, and, and yet, it's a huge key to this whole thing. And probably you've never noticed it. I never noticed it. Actually, until I had the backdrop of what I talked about last week, which was the genealogy and all those names and stuff, kind of gave me a backdrop to pick this up or to understand it. But watch this. I think the Holy Spirit's going to stir something in a bunch of us this morning with this. When the angel comes to Joseph, look at how he addresses him. This, again, this is so subtle. He doesn't just call him Joseph. What does he call him? Joseph what? Son of David. Joseph, son of David. And now what the angel does with that one little title, is huge. Because what he does is he qualifies Joseph with that statement. Now, you got to understand, we, we talked about this last week. As we track Jesus' lineage, one of the qualifying marks of the Messiah was that he would be from the line of kings, right? That was sort of one of the, the marks that they would, would know this is a legitimate candidate for the Messiah. God had established that covenant with his servant David in 1 Chronicles 17. And so that was one of the reasons, like I told you last weekend, that the Jews were so good at keeping genealogies and keeping accurate records because they were constantly on the lookout for the Messiah. And when he came, they would want to have legal proof. And so actually, out of curiosity, I looked up every biblical reference this week to that phrase, son of David. And it is a term that I've, I found, it's a term that is used exclusively, 100% of the time, used for those who are an heir to the throne of Israel. So now, here we have Joseph. And here's what we know about Joseph from a few later passages. He's a carpenter in the, the town of Nazareth. And so now he's in the middle of this drama with Mary, and an angel shows up, and he doesn't just say Joseph. What does he say? He says, Joseph, son of David. In other words, what the angel does is he, he, he says, Joseph, you are of the line of kings. Joseph, you are more than just a carpenter. You're, you're something so much more. There is a potential within you that has not yet been realized, that has not yet been unlocked. Because I don't think Joseph realizes who he is. I don't think Joseph knows who he is. In fact, if you look in the book of Matthew, chapter 13, years later, when Jesus is in Nazareth, his hometown where he grew up, and what is the response that they give him? They say, the, the people there, they say, where did this man, talking about Jesus, where did this man get his wisdom and these miraculous powers? Isn't this the carpenter's son? Okay, the people of Nazareth look at Joseph and they don't see a king or somebody that is a descendant of the kings. They see a carpenter and that's what they see when they see his son as well. In other words, if Joseph really knew that he was from the line of kings, he kept it a pretty good secret because his hometown didn't know. Okay, he kept it under wraps. Now, the political landscape in Israel at this time is such that there is no king, not, a, not an Israelite king or a Jewish king. There was no throne for a king to sit on. The, the, the people of Israel were under the rule of the Romans, 
And all of the government was appointed by Rome. And so you had Caesar like a thousand miles away over in Rome, right? And now he's appointing people like Herod to sit as the appointed king. But what the angel tells Joseph is this, Joseph, you are of the line of David. What that means is, Joseph, you have the legal right to the throne. And by virtue, the Messiah will come through your line. He basically tells him, Joseph, Mary's not crazy. I know this sounds crazy. I know that this looks crazy. I know it doesn't add up in your mind. But Joseph, Mary isn't crazy. She is virtue, uh, pregnant by virtue of the Holy Spirit. And it's the coming Savior that is going to come through her, the Messiah that's going to be given birth, that she's going to give birth to. Joseph, this is crazy. I know it's unbelievable. I know, but don't run from this, Joseph. Embrace your calling. And I emphasize this for this reason. This is what I believe the Spirit of God is, is speaking this morning. There is great empowerment in knowing who you are. Great empowerment in knowing who you are. Whether Joseph knew it or not, he was a king in God's eyes, not a carpenter. That if there had been a throne to be sat upon, Joseph was the one who would be sitting on it. Now, he wasn't living like it, right? He was not living like it. He was like the lion. Remember, remember that movie, The Lion King? How many of you have seen The Lion King? Okay? Simba is out in the wilderness slurping down bugs, singing Hakuna Matata, you know, or whatever, okay? <laughs> he should be eating zebra. He's the Lion King, and he's slurping down bugs, right? He is living a life that is so far below his calling and his appointment given by God as a lion, right? He's settling for so much less. Why? Because he's bought into a lie that he's been disqualified for that position, right? That's kind of how the movie goes. He was lied to. You don't, you don't qualify for this anymore. And he bought it. He believed it. Okay? God needed to awaken Joseph to who he really was so he could fully embrace his calling. And this morning, God wants to awaken you. He wants to remind you, you're a king. You're a queen. You're, you're, you've, you've got the right DNA. You've got the right heritage. Why are you settling for a carpenter in Nazareth when you've got a higher calling. Not that there's anything wrong with being a carpenter in Nazareth, mind you. You've got a higher calling. You've got something within you that needs to be unlocked. You say, I don't know if I buy it, Pastor Ryan. You don't know me. You don't know my background. You don't know my story. You don't know my heritage, my DNA, what have you. Listen, I'm going to give you three scriptures this morning that are to prove it to you really quickly. I'm going to read them actually all back to back to back, okay? And then I'm going to tie them together. Now, if you have a pen or a highlighter, and if you have a Bible, you need to get these underlined in your Bible this morning, okay? Like, you need to have these scriptures underlined. You need to have an understanding of these. I don't care if you have, like, the most ancient manuscript of the Bible that's worth millions of dollars. It needs to be underlined in that Bible, okay? This morning, whatever it takes, get it done. Romans 8, here's where we're going. Romans 8, Galatians 4, Ephesians 3, okay? Romans 8, for those who who are led by the Spirit of God, are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by Him we cry, Abba, Father. Verse 16, the Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are, what's the word? Heirs. Heirs of God and co heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. Galatians 4 should just be a couple of pages past Romans, not too far. Okay, Galatians 4, verses 4 through 7 says this, but when the time set had fully come, God set his son, sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father, so you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also a what? An heir. Now, Ephesians 3. In reading this, 
then you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made to, known to people in other generations as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are what? Heirs together with Israel, members together of one body and sharers together in the promise of, Jesus, of Christ Jesus. Let me tie these th three things together, okay? There's a consistent theme there. What's the word? Heirs, right? Okay, so here's the deal. We toss around this phrase, child of God, like it's like some kind of cheap jargon, right? Oh, I'm a child of God. Oh, we's just all God's children, you know? <laughs> it's, it's not quite like that. It's those who have the spirit of Christ within them that are actually his children. And as the passage in Ephesians so graciously declares, this has nothing to do with actual bloodlines. That most of us, probably no, maybe none of us in the room are Jewish. Anybody here Jewish? Okay. No, we're Gentiles. Okay. But Ephesians, the, the last verse that I read, declares that we are qualified, even as Gentiles, to be a part of this, not just for the Jews. And yet, that not just are we qualified to be children of God, okay, that we are heirs, we are co-heirs with Christ, that we were once slaves, we were caught in bondage and sin, but now you and I have moved out of that status into the realm of being princes and princesses in the kingdom of God, okay, that literally everything, say everything, everything that was in Christ Jesus now dwells in you in the form of his spirit. Colossians 2, 9 and 10. Listen to this. It declares, this is so powerful. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. So what that, what that says is all the power of God the Father dwelt in Christ. And in Christ, all of that has been brought into you. The fullness has been brought into into you. He is the head over every power and authority. Listen, when we begin to get this in our spirit, we're going to realize that most of us have been living like Joseph as carpenters in a dingy old town in Nazareth when we've got a higher calling, when we've got a, a, an authority as rulers in the kingdom of God that God has called us to and he's designed us to live that way. Now, I want you to think of this in today's terms with me really quick. Imagine if tonight you get a phone call, and you find out legitimately that you are the direct heir of Bill Gates. Okay? How would your life change? For one, you would stop eating ramen noodles and peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Okay? And you would upgrade your dining just a little bit. You would probably go and get rid of your 1990 rusty Ford Taurus that you've been driving around trying to limp around town in, and you would start driving a nicer car. You would probably move into a nicer house, right? Because you've got all the access to all of the resources that come with that name, Gates, part of the Microsoft Corporation, okay? You would hopefully give some of it to Solid Rock Family Church, just in case that actually happens. Just going to throw that out there. It's just a possibility, okay? Okay. You would give some to charity, though. You would pursue your dreams a little more recklessly because you could afford those dreams and you could afford to fail at those dreams. Your life would change. And probably many of us, if we're honest, we've probably dreamed of that kind of scenario, you know, winning the lottery or you know, having some kind of inheritance that we didn't see coming and, and how would our life change. We've probably dreamed about that from time to time. But you know, in that scenario, that, all that is, that's an upgrade in money and status. And for the most part, everything you would ever do with that would still just not have an eternal value, right? Because in that scenario, you still return to the dust, right? And you still can't take your house with you, even if it's bigger, right? You can't take your car with you, even if it's nicer. It's just back to the dust. But now, in real life, no, well, let's imagine or anything. In real life, God has said, because of Jesus, you have been made an heir with him, okay? And then the father says, on top of that, all that I have, I put into him. And all that was in him is now in you. That you have access to the treasury of heaven. Forget Bill Gates. you got access to the treasury of heaven. The cattle on a thousand hills, all of that, you know. Probably grass-fed beef cattle too, right, babe? I mean, good stuff. 
<laughs> You've got more, much, 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 much more than finances, though. You've been given direct access to the power of God, the same power that Jesus utilized here on earth. And so now Jesus makes it very clear how we access that heir status. Right? Because we got that status, but how do we access it? And it's a really simple three-letter word. Are you ready? Ask. Jesus said, ask. Matthew 7, 7 through 11. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So much of what we lack is a result of failing to ask. Sometimes I think we ask for the wrong things. You know, hopefully, as a, if those that are parents, hopefully you're not just a pushover. You know, if your kid comes to you and says, Mom, Dad, can we have ice cream for dinner? Okay, hopefully... You're not just going to be like, oh, yeah, well, you asked, so here you go. Let's dish up the ice cream. That's what we're having for dinner. Hopefully, the plan is you're going to give them a healthier dinner option, and if they're lucky, maybe a scoop of ice cream to go with it at the end of the night, right? I think sometimes we as Americans, we ask God for ice cream in life. <laughs> I think we're asking for the wrong things, and that's maybe why we're not getting those things, because we're, like, asking for all the sweet stuff, and God says, no, 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 I've got, I've got something a little better for you, a little more nutritious for you. But what our good father isn't going to do is send you to your room with nothing to eat, <laughs> right? He's not going to just leave your needs untaken care of. He's going to provide if we ask. And so what if, what if you, what if I, as a co-heir with Christ, laid claim to the things that God has declared are ours by asking? What if we begin to lay claim to spiritual freedom? What if you begin to lay claim to health? What if you begin to lay claim to a harvest of souls of lost people around you? What if you begin to lay claim to financial provision? What if you begin to lay claim to a healthy marriage or, or a healthy relationship with your kids? What if you begin to ask God for spiritual fruit, things like self-control and patience and kindness and joy? What if you begin to ask God for things like wisdom? I mean, you got a big decision to make. We're talking about a guy, Joseph, who had a big decision to make. Should he marry the girl or not? you got a big decision. You don't know how to make it. James 1.4 says, if any of you lacks wisdom, ask God. And he gives it generously, gives it generously to those who ask him. What if we begin to lay claim to those promises and, and take up our role, not as carpenters, but as kings? Like Joseph in his dream, the, the Lord is saying, you know what? You're the line of kings. Wake up. Something big is about to happen through you. Ask him for it. Matthew 1 concludes by saying this as the band comes back this morning, excuse me, comes back this morning. Verse 22, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. Joseph listens to God, and the result is one that the world is still celebrating. By marrying Mary, she was perfect, protected Excuse me from the scorn, the shame, even the legal proceedings that likely would have cost her her life. As far as anyone knew, the baby was Joseph's. And remember, she didn't give birth in Nazareth. She gave birth in, in Bethlehem. And after that, they fled to Egypt, so no one back home would have even been any wiser for the fact that the baby wasn't actually Joseph's. It was from the Spirit of God. Interestingly, he never touched her until after God had brought to fruition all that was, in, uh, was planned. This is kind of the, the character that this man had. Shouldn't we have that kind of character? God can do so much with a humble man or a humble woman who's gracious with others, who is patient, who's merciful as Joseph was, who is willing to, 
to look out for the interests of another person even though he was feeling hurt. And he can, he can use a man or a woman who realized, realizes the calling, the power that he wants to pour out through their life. All he did with Joseph is he brought to earth his only begotten son. What does he want to do through you? What does he want to do through you? Do you realize who you are? Heavenly Father. I thank you. I praise you. God, that you've got an incredible calling. God, over our lives, you've got an incredible, powerful calling. God, you have set us aside to do incredible things for your kingdom, just as you did incredible things through the life of this man, Joseph. Thank you, Lord. So what we need to do really quickly this morning, I'm going to have those that are here that are part of our prayer team, if you can just kind of quickly move into position. Uh, this is what I just feel stirred in my spirit that, you know, at the end here, we've been talking about asking. What do we need to ask God for? Okay, some of us in the service this morning, we need to ask God for some things. Okay, we need to just go ahead and grab a hold of that and say, God, I believe you're my healer. God, I believe you're my provider. Right now, I can't see it. Right now, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Right now, I'm, I'm in a lot of pain or I'm a lot of, you know, lack. But, God, I want to ask. I want to invite you to join us here as we have some prayer team people that are just going to go ahead and, and position themselves and we just want to pray for you. Whatever needs you have going on in your life, whatever those things might be, okay, this is going to kind of be the sort of informal close to our service this morning. And so if you don't have a prayer need and you're ready to slip out at this time, you can feel released to do so. Have an awesome week. Thank you so much for being here. But if you have a need this morning, we want to take time to minister to that and believe that God, our Father, has said, I have provided for you right out of the treasury of heaven. You're an heir a co-heir with Christ, and all that I have is yours. He wants to bless you this morning. Love you, church. Thanks for being here with us. Drive safely out there in the fog. We'll look for you again next Sunday.